We are in week three of an eight-week series called Getting Along. We're looking across the weeks at eight biblical solutions to conflict. Uh, in the last two weeks, we've already looked at how to tame your anger and how to negotiate. Uh, across the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at such important subjects as how to communicate well. Uh, we're going to look at the power of forbearance and forgiveness and know the difference between those things. We're going to look at how to confront somebody when we need to. We're going to look at how to intervene in somebody else's conflict. Sometimes the conflict isn't between us and another person. It's between two people we love. And the Bible tells us we have a responsibility there. And we're going to look at how a greater trust in God can help us a better deal with conflict. All of those things are coming up. But today we're going to look at a really uncomfortable part of the process of conflict resolution. And that is admitting our contribution to the problem. Now, when I talk about this, I'm not saying that we need to investigate whether we're the ones who started it and ask forgiveness if we realize that we're the ones who started it. A lot of times uh, we're really just asking that question, who started it? And if we feel like we weren't to blame for starting it, we think we're completely in the clear. But how have you perhaps exacerbated the problem even if the other person started it? What have you done that was a violation of God's rules in the relationship even if somebody else was the first one to start breaking the relationship? That's what we need to look at today. So take a look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So this passage reveals two options, options that apply in a lot of settings, options that apply in a conflict. We can pretend that we don't have any sin and if we do that, we will deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, or we can confess our sin and experience cleansing and forgiveness. So in every conflict, we can take one of these options and experience one of these consequences. So I want us to look at these two options today. Now, for some of us, this is going to feel more like a workshop than a sermon. And if you've ever been in a workshop, you know it's always helpful to have your workbook open. And in this case, your, your, your notes will be in your print bulletin or your online bulletin. And it would be really helpful for you as we follow along on all the details that I'm gonna be talking about. It'd be really helpful if you had the, those sermon notes open and fill them out as we come to them. So the first option is to say we have no sin. Can we really do that when we're in a conflict, even if we didn't start it? Can we say that we haven't exacerbated the situation at all? This passage says in verse eight that if we claim to have no sin, that we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Psalm 36 verse two says of the wicked, they think too much of themselves so they don't see their sin and hate it. I don't wanna be like that person. I know you don't wanna be like that person. So let's spend a little time looking at how we can possibly exacerbate a problem even if somebody else started it. Here are four questions to ask your soul. First of all, have I used words as weapons. Have I used words as weapons? James chapter 3 verses 5 and 6 say, the tongue is a small thing, but what enormous damage it can do. A tiny spark can set a great forest on fire, and the tongue is a flame of fire. I want you to think of all the ways that we can use words as weapons. Words become weapons when we use them recklessly, according to the Bible. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 18 says, reckless words pierce like a sword. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 20 say, there's more hope for a fool than for someone who uses or speaks without thinking. Proverbs 13 3 says, a quick retort can ruin everything. Now what is a retort? A retort is a reply. It is your verbal reaction when somebody has offended you. So you see, it's not enough just simply to say, who started this conflict? Who started this broken relationship? Once the relationship starts to break, how did you reply to it? How did you respond to it? According to this, this proverb, it can ruin everything depending on how you respond to the start of conflict. So words become weapons when we use them recklessly. Words become weapons when we use them to grumble and complain. Uh, James chapter five, verse nine says, don't grumble about each other, my brothers and sisters, 
or God will judge you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15 say, in everything you do, stay away from complaining and arguing so that no one can speak a word of blame against you. Now, when do we tend to grumble? When do we tend to complain? When somebody has done something that we don't like. When somebody has changed a situation we're comfortable with, when somebody has interrupted a process that we thought was going smoothly, that's the time when we grumble and complain. So again, it's not enough just simply to ask, who started this? In that instance, maybe they started it, but yet when we grumble and we complain, we end up being part of the blame, part of the problem. And these passages tell us we need to make sure and not do that. Here's another way that words become weapons. Words become weapons when we speak them falsely, when we use them in a false way. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 28 says, don't say things that are false. Another English translation is don't slander. Now the interesting thing is the Greek word behind words that are false or words that are slanderous, the Greek word is diabolos. Now the word diabolos is used in the New Testament 34 times to refer to a specific personality, to refer to the devil. The devil is a slanderer. The devil is a one who uses false words. You and I become devil-like. We become uh, diabolos when we use words that are false. Any form of misrepresentation or deceit is a form of being diabolical. Now, lying for sure shows up on that list, but what about unflattering exaggeration against the person you're frustrated with? What about telling only part of the truth? When you're telling the story to somebody else about the conflict that you're in, do you only share certain elements of it and conveniently leave out elements of the story that might make you look unflattering? If that's the case, then you're engaged in something that is diabolical. You are using slander, you're using false words. Words become weapons when we gossip. That's another way that we use words as weapons, when we gossip. And the Bible has a lot to say about this subject. Here's a principle that we need to follow. If somebody is not part of the solution, they should not be part of the conversation. If somebody is not part of the solution, they should not be part of the conversation. A lot of times we do need to talk with other people about a conflict we're in with someone else. We need to talk with a counselor. We need to talk with a trusted advisor. We need to talk with a friend. But in those instances, what are we seeking? In those instances, we are seeking somebody who can help us solve the problem. Somebody who can help us stay godly in the midst of the frustration. But the reality is for a lot of us, when we talk about conflict to somebody else, we're not looking for solutions, we're looking for allies. We're looking for people who can get on our side, people who can groan and complain about that person like we do. And if that's the case, we're sinning. We're engaged in gossip because we are talking with people who are not part of the solution. And so they shouldn't be part of the communication. When Paul describes some immature believers to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, here was his description. They get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying things that they ought not to. Words can become weapons. After a conflict starts, we need to examine ourselves for reckless words, grumbling and complaining words, false words, and gossiping words. All of this the Bible labels as godless chatter. It's, it's chatter because it's conversation. It's godless because it is conversation used in a way that is contrary to God's rules, contrary to God's law. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 16 says, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. What a great word, indulge. What do we, we, we when we indulge in something, we're engaged in it because we like it, right? We indulge in that dessert. We indulge in that pleasant experience. In this passage, the Bible says, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it, those who luxuriate in it, those who wallow in it, become less and less godly themselves. So all of this was under that first inventory question, have I used words as weapons? There's a second uh, inventory question we need to ask ourselves though, have I broken my commitments? Have I broken my commitments? It may be that the other person started the break, the other person uh, tore up the relationship to start with, but 
as we respond to it, some of us may feel that that gives us openness, that gives us freedom to break the commitments we've made to that other person. And according to the Bible, that's not true. We contribute to a conflict when we break a commitment that we have made to somebody. A contract, a business contract is a commitment. A marriage is a commitment. Any promise we make, no matter how small or trivial, is a commitment. God expects us to do what we say we're going to do. Disagreement with somebody does not allow us to break those prior commitments that we made to that person. So even when there's conflict in an office, projects still have to be done as long as you're employed there under somebody's contract. Even when there's conflict in a home, responsibilities still have to be fulfilled and met, even if there's conflict. So if we're in a conflict and we think that gives us an excuse for breaking our prior commitment to the person or to the persons we're doing it wrong. Here's a third question to ask. Have I used others to get what I want? Have I used others to get what I want? Uh, now, this is a, a temptation for all of us in the room, but it's especially true for those of us who have authority, those of us who have responsibility over people. When conflict breaks down between leaders and those that they're in authority over, when that happens, sometimes that person can end up exploiting and end up using the relationship for ulterior ends instead of seeing the relationship as an end in itself. And that's why the Bible tells everybody who's in a position of authority to be particularly careful with this. Uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45, you've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around uh, and when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not gonna be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. This is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served and then give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. I'm sure you've read the book of Ephesians before and you get to Ephesians chapter six, Ephesians chapter five and six, and Paul just goes through the list of those who have responsibility over others, those who are in authority. Then he says, don't use your position for abuse, but for service and for love. And so he says to husbands, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. He says to parents and especially to dads, don't uh, uh, be, be loving as you discipline your children. He says to employers over employees, make sure that that you treat your employees right because you uh, have a boss yourself that you're accountable to. God is, is your boss. And so he goes through that, that list in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 6. So if we're a leader who's in conflict with others that we have responsibility for, we need to ask ourselves, have I exploited? Have I used that person? Are they simply objects to me now to get what I want? But there's another side to that coin. Because when there's a conflict between those in authority and those under authority. Sometimes it's the person in authority who can abuse the relationship. Sometimes it's the person under authority who can abuse the relationship. So here's a fourth question as we examine ourselves. Have I failed to respect authority? Have I failed to respect authority? God has established a structure in the church. He's established a structure in the home and in and government institutions. We need to make sure that we are paying attention to that. If we're under authority and there's conflict or differences of opinion, that doesn't give us free reign to disrespect authority. And so just as scripture tells a husband to lead in his home in a sacrificial way, Ephesians 5.33 says the wife must respect her husband. And just as the Bible tells leaders in a church to make sure to serve those they lead, the Bible also tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that those who are under the authority of leaders in the church must respect those who are in leadership. And just as scripture tells employers to lead without uh, resorting to threats, uh, uh, the first two verses of 1 Timothy 6 tell us that employees ought to have proper respect toward their bosses. And just as scripture guides parents on how to nurture their kids, Ephesians chapter 6 calls on kids to honor their parents. And so over and over again in the Bible, the Bible tells us that we are in these structures of responsibility, these structures of authority. And when conflict breaks down between those who lead and those who are under authority, those who lead don't have free reign to just simply uh, eliminate the relationship aspect of it and just use people. And on the other hand, those who are under authority don't have free reign to disrespect those who are in authority. Now, obviously this doesn't mean mute compliance with the direction that somebody in authority is taking us. 
We just don't ignore a direction that we feel is unwise. We certainly don't ignore a direction that we feel is, is ab absolutely sinful. We're going to talk next week about how to communicate skillfully, but just, just know that there are several places in the Bible where those who are under authority nevertheless brought up a subject to those who were in authority, uh, but they did so in a way that wasn't disrespectful. And so you have in uh, the book of Daniel several instances where Daniel speaks to those in, th in, a, in governmental authority over him, but he does so in a way that is respectful and he corrects them. We find it in the book of Esther. One of the most famous examples in the Bible is the prophet Nathan appearing before King David and finding a clever and appropriate way to confront David about his adultery with Bathsheba. So we have several places in the Bible where we are told if we're under authority to confront those who are in authority over us, but we have to do it in a way that is thoughtful, in a way that is respectful. Otherwise, we're in violation. When we murmur, when we're filled with malice, when we commit mutiny, we're not doing what the Bible tells us to do. Now, I want you to look over those four questions on your sermon notes again. Have I used words as weapons? Have I broken my commitments? Have I used others? Have I failed to respect authority? Can these things cause relationships to break down? Sure. But it's interesting how many times, even if somebody else starts the breakdown, we feel we therefore have permission to disregard God's rules in the relationship. And, and so we use words as weapons and we break our commitments and we use others and we fail to respect authority. It's amazing how skillful we can be at justifying and excusing our own poor behavior in a broken relationship when we're convinced that somebody else started it. Even if most of the blame truly lies on the other person, if there's anything that you have done that is wrong in that relationship, if you have exacerbated the problem in any sort of way, that it's important for us to not ignore it, but do something about it. So let's go back to our, our, our starting Bible verse again, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And we've got these two options here. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's the first option. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the first option when we find ourselves in, in conflict is to say, I've done nothing wrong, I'm doing nothing wrong. And according to this passage, it may well be that the truth is not in you and you are deceiving yourself. Or the other verse tells us that we can confess our sin and we can find cleansing and healing and forgiveness. In our review of scripture today, as we've looked at the ways that we can exacerbate and complicate a conflict once it starts. Did we find anything that we need, that we, we feel bad about? Did we find anything that, that we realize we need to fix? If that's the case, then it's the second option that we need to deal with. We need to confess our sin. Now confession is such a challenge that I want to give you four ways to do that. First of all, admit your sin. By the way, all of these come from a book by Ken Sand called The Peacemaker. I actually had uh, seven in his book, but for the sake of time, we'll only look at four, and that'll get us a, a ways down the road. So first of all, admit your sin. Now, when 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says to confess our sins, does that mean that we need to confess them to God or confess them to others? Well, let's clarify this by looking at another passage in James. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, and it's in your notes. Make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. So the, the Bible tells us that we, we need to confess. We need to confess to God and when necessary, we need to confess to others. We need to let our confession go as far as our offense went. So if our offense only went so far as to offend God, then we only need to confess to Him. Every sin... Every broken commandment, every break of the rules is, is an offense to God. And so, of course, we need to confess to Him. But if our offense went not only against God, but it hurt somebody else, it offended somebody else, then we need to include them in the confession as well. So as you decide who needs to hear your admission of sin, it depends on what you're admitting and how you've offended somebody. Here's the second thing. Apologize. Not only admit your sin, apologize. 
Now this part of, of making things right is so complicated that we need to spend a little time with this. So let me give you some pointers at this point. Pointers I need to learn or need to continue to learn myself. First of all, avoid if and but and maybe when you're making your apology. The best way to ruin a confession is to couch it and soften it in such a way that it sort of mitigates and minimizes your role in the situation. Have you ever heard somebody say this to you before? I'm sorry if I've done something to upset you. The moment you use the word if, it's no longer a confession, right? And, and what is somebody saying when they say, I'm sorry if I've done something to upset you? They're saying, I don't know what I've done. I can see clearly that you're upset and I really just wanna put all this behind us, so I'm sorry. That's not really a confession. It's not really an apology. Here's some other ways that we can ruin an apology. Perhaps I was wrong. Uh, I could have tried harder, I suppose. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have reacted until I heard your side of the story. I'm sorry I told those stories about you, but you really upset me. None of that is fully an apology, is it? We have to strike through all those ifs and buts and maybes if we mean business. Now, now that we know this, however, I want you to make sure that you don't become an apology Nazi. You know what a grammar Nazi is? A, a grammar Nazi, you, you, you write something on social media and, somebody, and suddenly somebody jumps on and tells you how you misspelled that word or how you used it grammatically incorrectly. Uh, I think I just said something that was grammatically incorrect. <laughs> or, they, or, they, or they tell you about your punctuation and so on, they become grammar Nazis, right? Don't become an apology Nazi. I mean, if somebody else uses those words like if and maybe and they soften in that way, be gracious to them. They probably won't hear to hear this sermon so they don't know how to apologize correctly. Uh, or they may be feeling their way back into a relationship with you and they're not quite sure yet whether they can trust being vulnerable in front of you. So be gracious and be gentle when somebody else is doing an apology wrong. But you, now that you know what to do, make sure you do your apology right and remove the words if and maybe and but and all of those qualifiers and those things that soften your role in the process. Here's another suggestion when it comes to apologies and that is apologize specifically. If, if you've let people down at work, don't just generically and broadly say, I don't think I've been a very good coworker, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry that I didn't meet this deadline. I was too distracted and, and uh, I was too focused on other things and, and, and I'm sorry I, I didn't meet this deadline. You know, one helpful thing to do is to acknowledge and express sorrow over the way you now know that other person felt about what you did. You must have been really embarrassed when I said those things in front of everyone, I'm sorry I did that to you. Or I can see why you were frustrated when I didn't meet my deadline, I'm sorry I didn't get that done on time. Apologize. Here's a third one, accept the consequences. I mean, it's not really an apology if it's just words, right? I mean, if there's still broken things all around that you broke and that you need to fix and you're not fixing them and you just apologize for them, that's not a real apology. Think about Zacchaeus in the New Testament. Uh, I won't take too long on this. It's a short story. Um, in Luke chapter 19, <laughs> in Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus is met by Jesus, and Jesus comes to lunch with that wee little man. And, he, and at his house, Jesus confronts him about his sin, about his way he abused other people and took advantage of his tax collection business and stole from people. And Zacchaeus apologized for it, and he apologized specifically, didn't he? He apologized specifically by saying that anybody he had stolen from, he was going to pay it all back with interest. Now this is somebody who really had changed his life. So when we change our lives, when we apologize, when we realize there's some broken stuff that we broke, we need to be ready to fix it in a very specific way. Number four, ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Will you forgive me is a question you need to ask when you've apologized. And this question signals that you feel you've done everything that you could do to fix the problem that you created or the problem that you complicated. And now it's up to the other person to grant forgiveness to you. Now you need to be ready to allow time for this if needed. You thought through it. You finally worked up the courage to sit down with the person and share your part in the problem. And now you need to perhaps give them time. Some, sometimes people are immediately ready to forgive. Other times they, they need a little time to go by. They need to sort of process through what you're saying and, and what their feelings are about what you're saying. 
And of course, sometimes people aren't going to be willing to forgive you at all. But at least you've done your part in the process by going through these steps. So when you find yourself in conflict, you've got two options according to 1 John chapter 1. You can say, I've done absolutely nothing wrong. I'm doing absolutely nothing wrong to complicate this situation. And it may well be that the truth is not in you and you are deceiving yourself. Or you can confess your part in the problem and find that healing and cleansing and forgiveness can begin to flow into your life. Like everything else in the Christian life, all of what we've been talking about today is just an extension of the story of the cross. We come in here every Sunday and we sing songs that remind us about the cross, about the gospel story. What is the gospel story? The gospel story is about a broken relationship, isn't it? A broken relationship between us and God. Who started it? We did. We sinned, we rebelled, we went our own way, we offended God by pretending that we knew better than his rules, we broke the relationship. But what did God do on his side of this? He didn't leave us in our sins, he didn't leave this broken relationship alone. In Jesus he reached out to us, he served us, and he forgave us. Now, when it, when it comes to the gospel story, we need to believe it because it's true. We need to believe it because our salvation depends on it. But we also need to believe it because it sets the pattern of our lives from here on out. Just as God reached out to us and served us and forgave us when we broke the relationship with him. In the same way, we need to reach out to others and we need to serve them and be ready to forgive them even if they began the process of breaking a relationship with us. But that is not what we do so often, is it? You wrote it down on your notes. When somebody breaks a relationship with us, we use words as weapons and we break commitments and we use others to get what we want and we fail to respect authority. We need to come to Jesus as our Savior, but then we need to live as if Jesus is really our Lord because he is and the way he treated us is now the way we need to treat other people reaching out to them serving them being ready to forgive them so my invitation to you today is to come to Jesus and if you've come to Jesus my invitation is that you go out of this room in just a few moments ready to do what he has done for you when you realized your relationship with him was broken so let's go to the Lord in prayer I want to invite you to come to Jesus I want to invite you to receive the gospel. I want you to say in your heart of hearts now or sometime very soon, I want you to say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross to take away my sin. I realize that I broke the good relationship that you want with me. I broke it because of my sin, my selfishness. Because of my rebellion against your word, I broke off the relationship, and yet you pursued me, and you came after me, and I want to receive that good news, that gospel today. But others of us in here, we've prayed that prayer, but in our broken relationships, we haven't mirrored what Jesus has done for us in our relationship to others, and maybe we need to do something like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me, for saving me, Thank you for pursuing me when I broke off things with you. And now I want to be Jesus for other people in my life. People who I believe have started the conflict. People who broke off things with me. But I want to be Jesus for them. And so help me to do that, Lord. Help me to not justify or excuse behavior and words and actions that are complicating, that are exacerbating the situation. Forgive me for those things. And, and give me the courage to reach out and ask forgiveness for when I've done those things to others. And help me then be Jesus for somebody. Help me to, to reach out and to stand ready to forgive and to stand ready to serve. Heavenly Father, we pray these things so that you would smile with approval upon us, your kids. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.